the old man fall in the well? Because he couldn't see that well. <laughs> My favorite, though, why does the Norwegian Navy have barcodes on the size of their ships? So they can Scandinavian. <laughs> that was a good joke. So we're doing a sermon series called Work Hard, Play Hard, Pray Hard. And uh, one of the things I've encouraged you to do for Harvest Palooza is to go the extra mile. I know Mike, talk, Mike Babbitt talked about it last week. Let me make this really, really clear to you, very simple. I took a little walk yesterday or the other day, and uh, I prayed there is a one-mile track around uh, South Central Park. Did y'all know that? There's a one-mile track. It's one mile. And Jesus said that when somebody asks you to go a mile, in other words, to to serve at Harvest Palooza, you should volunteer to go the what? So what would the extra mile be? Go over there and take a walk around the track or jog around the track, go the extra mile and pray for Harvest Palooza. Pray for people's hearts who will show up, pray for 75 and sunny. We do not want rain on Harvest Palooza Day. All in favor of that, say amen. amen. All right, God, you heard that, all right? So you want good weather, you want God's spirit to be there, you want it to be good. And then all I'm asking you to do is, let's just build some excitement around Harvest Palooza and put on whatever your social media is, put up something like my ugly mug, I did, and just see the hashtag Harvest Palooza, hashtag extra mile, do it. Do it. Do it this week. Go over, pray. And if you don't want to do it there and you want to do it in your neighborhood, go out the back door. We got some flyers out there. You can walk in your neighborhood and pass out flyers, inviting people to Harvest Palooza and praying for your community. I don't care. Let's just pray and walk a mile and, and cover a mile. If you can't walk, you know, get on your scooter. I don't care what you got to do. Let's pray a mile. Drive slowly and, and take your anointing oil in a, in, a, in a water gun and shoot out the window on their door. I, I did that one time anointing houses with oil as I walk down the street praying for them. I know that's weird, but I've been known to be weirder than that. Speaking of weird, y'all ready? You ever feel like life sets you up to lose? You ever felt like life is like an intentional setup so you lose? When I was a kid, I used to play checkers with my grandpa, and I always lost. Grandpa would never let me win. So I developed a, a pattern. I never let anybody win. If you ever beat me at anything, it is because you beat me. My son is going, yes, there you go. If you beat me, you beat me. So I played checkers with my grandpa. I could never win. He would beat me every time. So there was another game we called swap out. Do y'all know what swap out is? It's the opposite of checkers. In checkers, your object is to take everybody else's checkers, but in swap out, your object is to get rid of all your checkers. And I thought, since grandpa is so good at taking all my checkers, I will always win at swap out and I will give him all my checkers up. I never won at that either. <laughs> because it was, well, I tell you what it was like. It was like Rob and I were in a casino. We, we, we walked through a casino, we were on a vacation. And uh, at night, you know, there's not a lot to do on a resort, so we would walk around and walk through. And we walked into this casino. I have not dropped a penny in a casino. I refuse to do it because all those great big casinos are built and so beautiful because they pay out so much money to all you winners. Anyway, I walk into this casino and we're watching be these people play and there's a whole table of them. They're like making a big deal. Yeah, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. We're so awesome. And they were playing blackjack and they were like, yeah, we're winning, we're ahead, yeah. And they had their stack of chips and one guy was like, oh, I need another stack for my chips. I'm all full here, you know. And about that time, they switched dealers. And I said to my wife, wife I said, you watch in three hands, they will lose. Sure enough. Third hand, they lost, started losing. I was watching the lady reach over into the deck, pulling out the cards, and she was selecting the cards she wanted to pull. So I, I know this because I said to the lady right in front of us, Robin said, you better watch it. They're about to take all of your money. And that very next hand, she got a 21. Coincidence, I'm sure. So she stayed with it. We came back an hour later, they were all broke. Because they gave a dealer whose job it was to cheat them out of their money. This was not in America, I'm sure. I'm sure in America they'd never cheat. <laughs> you know, even, even the universe is set up for your destruction. 
Do you realize that the universe is expanding? Did y'all know that? This is a scientific fact. There is no arguing this fact that the universe is expanding. And as it expands, the energy that causes the stars to glow and, and things to live, that energy is going farther and farther and farther apart. And it eventually will burn itself out. And eventually, even the entire universe will burn up, will create black holes, and there will be nothingness where a universe once existed. And that's simple science. So we're all doomed to die. Probably won't be around when that happens, but... Even the setup of the world, a second law of thermodynamics, what does that say? Does anybody know? What's that? Things tend to decay. Anybody ever have a house that was perfect when you moved in? And five years later, you're like, how did that happen? Anybody ever have a kid? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying is that things are in a constant state of falling apart and decay, and sometimes it seems like even the whole world is against you. I got good news for you today. If you got your Bibles open with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we are going to walk through a passage today, 1 Corinthians 2. I would ask you to stand to your feet in honor of God's word, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. And if you wouldn't mind, would you read together with me out loud from the screen? I think this verse is so good, we ought to read it together out loud. Y'all ready? What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. What God has freely what? Hmm. Every gift God gives us, says the scriptures, is good and perfect. God has a good and a perfect gift for us, but yet I just admitted that we feel like the world is against us sometimes. What do we need to do to figure this out? So, Father, I pray that today you would speak to us. I pray that our hearts would be open to what you would say, and I pray in the name of Jesus The word of God would not go forth with simply words of man's wisdom, but with the demonstration of the spirit and power so that our faith would not rest upon man's wisdom, but upon the power of God. And in the name of Jesus, I am asking you to bring freedom, to bring deliverance, to bring miracles into this house today so that your name would be held in honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn and high five somebody before you sit down because somebody needs a smile this morning. I want to talk to you about three simple statements today. Three statements that I want to make about the plan of God. Number one is God has a plan. Statement number one, God has a plan. It is wise when you listen to God's plan, right? Believe it or not, God is a little wiser than us and, and he probably is a little smarter than us. And if God has a plan, we should probably pay attention to his plan. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. By the way, there are a lot of people, and, and I, I believe there are a lot of people that have really good reasons for being atheists. I really do. They have good reasons for being atheists. The problem is, is they're not subjecting those good reasons to better reasons for being a Christian. So I really believe you have a lot of good reasons if you doubt and are skeptical to the faith. I, I do not question that at all. I, as a matter of fact, you probably are well convinced with the facts you have. What I would encourage you to do is to examine that there are facts outside of your realm of knowledge and to open up your hearts to facts outside of your realm of knowledge. And there are facts about the resurrection of Jesus that make it a very real and viable option. As a matter of fact, the problem I have with atheism, do you realize I talked about the universe that's falling apart, right? It's going, do you realize that atheism teaches that you have no purpose and no reason for being alive? The reason I'm informing us about this as church people is we live in a culture where more and more and more people every day are beginning to call themselves atheists. And the reason they're calling themselves atheists is they have never been confronted with the alternate wisdom of God who loves you and who died for you and who was resurrected from the dead and who has a plan for your life. They simply are living with the facts of science, which I do not dispute the facts of science. I sometimes sometimes dispute the, the takeaways from the facts of science. Y'all follow me? There are alternate facts. You see, there's a wisdom of this age, 
Wisdom of this age is saying there is no God, deny him, walk away from it. I deal with that temptation all the time because I actually read books and read articles and stuff that most of you gloss over. But I actually read them and I struggle with it. I'm like, God, how can I have faith in a world that's telling me this? Anybody ever struggle with that other than me? I struggle with it. And I'm like, God, where are you? How can you? What are the answers? And the, the wisdom of this age says to take a couple of facts, form an opinion, and walk away from God. And I'm telling you that there is a wisdom in a relationship with Christ that says take a couple of facts, dig a little deeper, find God's facts, and then you can find wisdom that enables you to live the kind of life God wants you to have. I hope that made sense. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery because you see, if you want to find God's, anybody ever watch like the old Perry Masons and stuff? Anybody ever watch those? And you try to figure it out. One day I was watching a Matlock and Matlock used to be a well-written show and they would always give you the clues that you could solve it before you got to the end. And I would watch and I'd be like, yes, I got it figured out. And then one day I'm watching a Matlock and they pulled somebody that hadn't been mentioned the entire show and made them the person who did the crime. And I'm like, why would I ever watch this show ever again? They don't give me the clues to figure out the mystery. Are y'all paying attention? But do you know what God does? God's plan is a mystery, but he gives us enough clues so that we can figure it out if we're really paying attention and wanting to figure it out. So God has a plan, but you got to look for it. You got to work for it. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory. Why do you look for God's plan? Because it's for your glory. It's not for your destruction. It is for our glory since before time began. Three truths about this plan of God. Number one, the plan has been in place from the beginning of time. 2 Corinthians 2, 7 says a mystery that's been hidden, God destined for our glory before time began. I could give you other scriptures that say the same thing. God has had a plan from the beginning of time and nothing has thwarted that plan either in the past and nothing will ever stop it in the future. Number two, the plan is for our glory, not our destruction. God has a plan to elevate you to where he wants you to be, not to take you down like this world and this culture wants to take you down. Do you know why everybody wants to take you down? Do you know why? They want to take you down because if you drop lower, anybody ever see this? Come on, I'm a pastor, all right? I'm a pastor. Can I, can I be honest with you for a second? There have been people that have fallen into sin that have bigger and shiner ministries than mine, and there have been times I've been tempted to go, yeah, I, I, I know you've never done that. Like you're on the basketball team and you're second string and the person in front of you on first string twists his ankle and you're like, secretly, you're like, yeah. Anybody ever done that in the room? Oh, you have? Then that's why you're thinking like the world system. Everything in this world system says, if you come down, I get to go up. You know what we really need to do? We need to get better at what we do instead of wishing other people would come down below us. You want God's plan? Work the plan. Because God's plan is for your glory, and other people don't have to suffer for you to get all that God has. Oh, come on, pastor. That's good preaching, bro. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11 says, hey, listen, if you don't help me out, I'm going to help myself out today because I'm just here. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. This is what God says. The plans declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God's plan is for your glory, not your destruction, not anybody else's destruction, but he wants his glory to be revealed. Third, his plan will not fail. God's plan will not fail. I love this verse. You should memorize this one. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. God's plan will not fail. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined. We're going to talk about that word predestined in a couple of minutes because I think maybe we might have a little bit different view of that by the end of today having predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. I know, I know. You thought you could goof up God's plan. But even your goof-ups, even your goof-ups help bring about the plan of God. So his plan will not fail. Number two, second thing we need to notice about the will of God is that God's desires to reveal his plan, and I'm going to say to you. 
The human mind cannot grasp the wonderful plan of God. When we walk with the Spirit, though, we get a bigger picture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. Have you noticed I'm staying right here in the passage? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had understood God's plan, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, that no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. The th these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. You know, God wants to have a living communication with you about what his plan for your life is. And that plan is the things that the spirit are already saying to your spirit. Do you know why, do you know why counselors make so much money now? Let me tell you why counseling is such a big deal in America. Do you know that counseling is a big deal in America? Did y'all know that? I'm always recommending people to go to counselors. You know why I have to ask them and recommend them to go to counselors? Do you know why you need a counselor? Because you have no friends. That's why you need a counselor, because you don't have friends. You know why you don't have friends? Because you pull up to your house, you pop open your garage door, you go into your house, you close your garage door, you go in your house and you hide from everybody and you live vicariously building relationships through social media where you look at a phone rather than look at a human and you have no friends. So you really don't talk to anyone. Because do you know what a counselor actually gets paid for doing? Listening to you talk. You come to them with a problem. But listen, if you're a believer in Jesus, you are. And I'm not, I'm not bemoaning Christian counseling. They've actually filling a void that needs to be filled. And I'm all for it. And I say, go to a counselor. They may help you. But most of you don't need a counselor. Most of you need some friends. And yet you refuse to get in a life group because you're more smart than God. I get agitated. I want to build a church here of people that are strong and they're vibrant and they're alive and they're life-giving, but yet the very things you need to do, you won't do them because you just won't. Get in a life group. Do you know what happens in a life group? You actually get to know somebody. Then you might actually have coffee with somebody. Then you might actually talk to somebody. And while you're talking, because if you pay a counselor, here's what they do. They listen to you talk until you say something that reveals God's spirit has already told you what to do to deal with a problem. <laughs> People come to me all the time. They want, they want me to counsel them. That is a bad idea. You do not want me to counsel you. Now, what I will do if you come to me is I will listen to you talk long enough until I hear you say what the answer is. Because, listen, if God's spirit already lives in you, he's already communicating with you what you ought to do. You're just a coward. You just won't do it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you to do what you said the answer was and you're afraid to do. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to walk out of the room and not do what you said you should do. Do you know why? Because I'm not kind enough to listen to you for another 20 hours until you talk yourself into it. But if you had a friend, life groups are going to be starting soon. For your mental and emotional and spiritual health, you should get in a life group. If you do not, are not a part of a life group, and you don't want to get in one, well, then start one. Pastor Matt, stand up. See this guy right here? As of last week, he will be in charge of life groups in the future. As of last week, Pastor Ashley is helping the transition. Sorry, I shouldn't go public with this. I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because some things need to be done. And you need to get in a life group. It is time for you to embrace God's plan. Between him and Pastor Ashley, I would say her, but she's not in the room. So between these two people, talk to them. If you want to start a life group, start one. We already have material to help you this fall. Everybody said amen. amen. Pastor, sit down, please. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I rushed that one. My bad. I'll hear about that one this week. I made a mistake, yes. But you know what? I'll make mistakes all day long because I would rather be real with you than perfect with you. No, I don't think you understand. I would rather be a leader that makes mistakes trying to help you than somebody that has my ducks in a row all the time. 
because I care. I want you to grow, and I want you to grow in the Lord. All right, I got to move ahead. God is looking for people he can entrust with his thoughts and desires. No eye is seen. No ear is heard. No human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. And these are the things that by the Spirit of God living in us, he is revealing them to us if we will listen. Do you know Proverbs? You know one of my favorite verses in the Bible? I've got... I always, my youth used to make fun of me when I was a youth pastor because every week I would say, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because I have like 10,000 favorite verses. This is one of my favorites. You ready? You ready? Proverbs 3, 32. You know what it says? For the Lord takes the upright into his confidence. You know how you are made for community to be in relationship with a person and talk to them? God made you because he wants to be in relationship with you and talk to you. And God has secrets he wants to tell you that you will never listen to unless you spend time with him. God, God has secrets he wants to tell you. Anybody ever have a good friend that tells you all their secrets? Anybody ever have one of those? Because they know you'll treat their secrets right? God wants a good friend in you that he can tell you his secrets. These thoughts and plans are even greater and better than you can imagine. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. I can imagine some cool stuff, but God wants to do immeasurably more. You can't even measure how much more. He wants to do more than you can imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Um, the problem is we're in the way. Real quick story. I was coaching uh, my daughter's fifth grade basketball team. And I had eight girls on this team, and we're playing a game one day, and we're down like four to two. A lot of scoring went on in that game. It's halftime, and the score was four to two. <laughs> we were getting good shots. We just couldn't make them. My offense was sort of working, but the girls were sort of sluggish. I had three girls that acted like they wanted to play a little bit. I had two girls that wanted to play, and the other five just sort of, you know, Stood around. So at halftime, I'm there, and I say to them, we can win this game. And they look at me, and I said, do you think we can win this game? And the girl said, one of the, girl, one of the girls said, I asked her, do you think we can win this game? And she said, no. <laughs> I don't know if you know much about me, but that just blew me away. <laughs> Whatever the temperature was in the room, I think it went up like 2,000 degrees. Well, we had practice a couple of days later, and Rachel still tells the story. It lives in infamy. It wasn't as bad as she tells it. But I made them, at the end of practice, I made them line up on the line. We went over stuff in practice. They still didn't get it. And I lined them up on the line, the baseline down at the end. And I said, do you realize that when I asked you if you could win, you said no. I said, the problem isn't that you don't have the talent to win. The problem is you don't think you can win. So we're going to get something in our head today. I want everybody to say this with me. I am not a loser. Yeah, so they said that, like you guys did. I am not a loser. <laughs> I said, no, I don't think you understand. You're going to scream, I am not a loser, and you're going to run to the other end of the floor. Now, one, two, three, go. I blew the whistle, and they went. I am not a loser. They run to the end of the floor. And I said, you don't get it. Scream it again and run back. And I ran them about eight or ten times the length of the floor. Now, Rachel says it went on for a half hour. But the whole deal is this, is I wanted them to get something in their brain. And what was the one thing I wanted them to get in their brain? They weren't a loser. Because we get in God's way. God wants to do more than you can imagine. And yet you look at your problems and you say, no. When all the while, the one who has the power of the universe within his hands is saying, ask me, it's at my disposal if you will change the way you think and the way you act. Okay. Number three, God wants to include you in his plan. God wants to include you in his plan. 
1 Corinthians 2.10 says, The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows the th- a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. I love this. Pastor Mike, can I tell you what you're thinking? You're thinking, why is he picking on me, right? Was that it? Am I clairvoyant? Yeah, but there were 50 other thoughts that went through your head. Give me two of them. It's yellow lights. Yellow lights. And happy to be here. Happy to be here. <laughs> Would I have ever thought he was thinking about yellow lights? But yet he has a whole realm of thinking going on in his head at this moment. Even now he's saying, that's weird. I don't, I don't know what all you're thinking. He may be thinking, oh, it's like a halo or a crown. But I don't know what he's thinking. But he is thinking it, is he not? And who knows what he's thinking? Do you know 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 what he's thinking? No. Who knows what he's thinking? His spirit is the only thing inside him that knows what he's thinking. You know, at this moment, you're all processing thoughts yourself. And nobody around you knows what those thoughts are. Have you ever sat in a room and you're thinking something about the person next to you, sort of hoping they don't know what you're thinking? (laughs) So what I'm saying is we have thoughts in our head and our spirits are aware of what our thoughts are. Nobody else knows it, but we do. You know... You speak at about one one hundredth the speed of which you think. That's the reason you get confused when you talk sometimes, is you're thinking 15 different things while you're saying one. Anybody ever do that and you let like three sentences out that they're all combined? The queen of it sits right here. (laughs) There is none better at getting a sentence that is jumbled with 13 different thoughts at the same time. I have to ask her to slow down and explain because she knows what she's thinking and in her brain she's making sense, but nobody else knows. Listen, listen. God's spirit is the same way. God knows, his spirit knows what he is thinking. And all those thoughts that are multitudes of God's thoughts about your situation, about the world, about the things he sees and he understands, he has thoughts about them all because he sees them all. And and are y'all ready for this? This scripture teaches us that who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And look at verse 12. And what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but it is the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, verse 13. Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit taught words so you actually can connect to God's spirit your spirit connects with God's spirit let me give you a Greek lesson here okay that last part spiritual realities with spirit taught words in the Greek it is there the the word pneumakos which is spirit appears three times in a row in three different forms spirit to spirit 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 to spirit spiriting And then the last word is soon crino, which is together judging. Hold on. You don't don't get this. Can I, would y'all listen for two seconds? Would everybody just pay attention? Your spirit and God's spirit can spirit together so that you know what God's judgments about everything is. Would that help you in your parenting? Would that help you in your schools, in your relationships, your jobs? Would it be a benefit to you in your relationships with your spouse? Would it be helpful? Then what we need to do as believers is start believing that our spirits, when they are renewed by the resurrected Jesus, are in contact with God's spirit, and that when these spirits together, when we align our thoughts with his thoughts, we will know what we ought to do, and we should do it with confidence. Second Corinthians 12 says to the one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom to another message of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing 
by that one spirit to another miraculous powers, another prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits, another speaking different kinds of tongues, still another interpretation of tongues. These are all spiritual gifts that are available to you when your spirit connects with God's spirit, then you have access to the powerful works of God to be able to speak and to do the things that will bring about the answers that God desires for the situation, not yours. When I read that list, some of you got caught up on tongues. You're like, yeah, it's just whatever. No, listen, listen, listen. I don't care what the gift is. If God's spirit wants me to have it in my spirit, I want it. So can I say something about this Pentecostal manifestation of tongues? Whatever you have that keeps you from experiencing all that God has, you need to remove it so that you could experience anything he has for you to experience. 1 Corinthians 2.14, back to our text, says, The person without the Spirit does not expect the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. And cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgment. So what God wants you to do is he wants you to be able to see the problem, the situation, and make a right judgment about it so that you can do the things that bring about his plan for this world. And I love this last verse. Verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him. But we, listen, who our spirits and God's spirit, God's spirit and our spirit are connecting. We have the mind of Christ. How does that look? I don't know how to pray about things. I'm an idiot, all right? I, when I pray, I pray, God, if you don't fix this problem for me, I'm going to goof it up more because I, God knows that I could goof up anything, but I trust in him and he will show me how to fix everything. That's how I feel about it. So when I pray, there are times I pray. Anybody ever find yourself praying and you're like, Lord, bless them? Anybody ever pray anything like that and you're like, I just don't know what to say now? Help them? God, help them? If you don't help them, there's a problem. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. That's interesting. There, there are groans, there are words, there are syllables, but they're not real words. And he searches our hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now I'm going to land this plane. We have a plan, God has a plan, and he includes us in this plan that if our spirits would connect with his spirits, we will understand what's going on, we can talk to him about it, and we will actually be able to fulfill his work on this earth. And yet we feel like it's an A-team. Anybody ever watch the A-team when you were a kid? Come on, older people in the room. Anybody ever watch an A-team? You younger guys, you have no idea, really. You saw that movie of the A-team? That's not the A-team. What you talking about? Pity the fool, right? Come on, anybody in the room know what I'm talking about? Mr. T, yeah. So they get this team together, and this team would get together, and they would make a plan, and then they would go out, and they would start enacting the plan, and what would happen to the plan? Fall apart. Everything goes haywire, and then at the end, there would be some weird thing that would happen, and then they would, a team would always win, and let's not talk about the weirdnesses of the A team. I got plenty of material. But anyway, then what would, what would they always say at the end? What, would, uh, what was the guy who was in charge? Hannibal. Hannibal. What would Hannibal always say at the end? I love it. Yeah, there, the plan falls apart, but yet the plan comes together, and they win. And that's how we feel sometimes in our Christian life. Like, we're doing our best, and everything just goes haywire. How can God bring about his plan in the middle of the haywire? Well, I'm going to tell you a story, but before I do that, I want to remind you, Romans 8, 28 says, we know that in all things, in how many things? All things. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. So God is not upset beyond control at our mess-ups. 
He foreknew, he also predestined. What did he predestine you to? Come on, what's the predestination here? So you would be what? Conformed to the image of his son. This is not predestination to heaven or hell. This is predestination to be conformed to the image of his son. All right? Because God predestines those who choose him so that they always win. I was reading, listening to some stuff and did a lot of research on this. You know, artificial intelligence is advancing. In 1996, a computer named Deep Blue beat the world's best chess player, Gary Kasparov. Did y'all know that? Deep Blue. It was a computer and it beat the best chess player in the world, Gary Kasparov. Deep Blue was able to process, you ready for this? 200 million possible board positions. As it was looking, it was processing 200 million options per second. Then in 2016, DeepMind Technologies tested their advances by playing a game called Go. What is Go? Go is a Chinese game played on a 19 by 19 board. In this match, well, let me tell you the difference between Go and Go and chess. Chess is played on an 8 by 8 board, and there are 200 million possible moves. But Go is played on a 19 by 19 board, and there are, let me see if I got this right, there are 250 options per disc with 150, so it's 250 options to the 150th power. That's 250 times 250 times 250, 150 times. Or another way of putting it is 10 to the 360th power. The meaning is that the options of the game Go are beyond the imagination of the human mind. So in 2016, this company called AlphaGo, they put a computer program together called DeepMind Technologies. And they played Go Master Kai G and defeated him over and over. In 2016, they played another guy named Lee Sedol, and that's how they learned what to do because they only beat him four out of five times. Then 2017, they played the best player in the world and they defeated him every single time because here's the deal. They noticed, this is where it gets good. The computer noticed that humans, even when they are trying to think outside the box, have a tendency to think the same way. No, 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 you're not getting this. Humans have a tendency to think similarly, and the computer was reading not only all of the possible options, but also the directional options of the people who were playing. Because they have a tendency to make the same decisions thinking the same way, and the computer would actually predetermine and know what move the person was going to make before they would move it because it had watched them play before. So the first game they might win closely, but the second, third, and fourth game, they're guaranteed defeat from the beginning because the computer knew what they were going to do. I don't think you got this. You still don't get it. Because you see, we made a computer designed like the rest of humanity to cause us to fail. We made a computer that determined and predecided our failure and plots against us even our own moves to make us fail. And that's artificial intelligence. Oh, come on, a couple of you are already heading off here. But God Almighty is the ultimate intelligence. And before the world began, God looked at the chessboard of all the lives and bo- all of our decisions. And you think he hasn't been watching humanity for all these years, and he's been watching you since the day you were born. He knows what decision you're going to make before you make it. And he plots and plans in advance because humans design things to make us fail. But God from the beginning is designing this life so that he has a plan for your success. That no matter what decision you made, no matter how bad it was, that if you will simply open up your heart to him and you will commune your spirit to his spirit, he can help you make a move that will win. No past decision is ever big enough to stop his future victory for you. Come on. Somebody ought to shout amen. 
Do you know the only way you can goof up God's predestination for you to be conformed to the image of Christ and to succeed and to be the man or woman of God he wants you to be with the life he wants you to be? You know the only way, the only way you can goof that up is to say no. It's the only way. It's to quit playing the game. The only way that God's plan won't work for you is if you just stop playing. Is if you walk away. Other than that, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how bad you goofed it up. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. I don't care what culture says about you. God has a plan, and he's had a plan since the creation of time that no matter what move you make, he's going to block you off and direct you so that you will wind up being conformed to the image of his son. All you got to do is walk in it. And the more you listen to him, the earlier and better his will gets done in your life. Hey, I want to ask you a question. The question is this. Number one, are you involved in a relationship with Jesus Christ so that he can make you win? Are you playing the game? Are you in relationship with him? If you are not, he can't make you win. So I'm gonna ask you this morning, would you choose him? Would you choose Jesus? Hey, often we bow our heads and close our eyes. Today, there is no bowed heads, there is no closed eyes. If that's you and you want to give your heart to Jesus today, it is your day to choose his way, his will, not yours. Bold. Would you lift your hand up really high where everybody can see? Yes. Yes. Are there others? Come on. Hold them up real high. It's your day. It's your day. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Don't, don't half clap. Yeah. So our prayer teams are coming forward right now. Prayer teams are coming forward. If you lifted your hands, would everybody stand up with me? If you lifted your hand, you want to give your heart to Christ, there's somebody up here that would love to pray with you today. If you also have a need, maybe you're deep into it, you're deep into it, and you're like, God, I don't know how I'm ever going to win. God, I don't know. Come on, we got somebody here to pray with you today. We got people who will pray with you and pray through it all. They're going to, the worship team's going to play quietly for a few minutes, and then uh, I'll come back up and say a closing prayer and then we'll let them rock us out a little bit. But I, I want you, if you want somebody to pray with you, there's somebody here to pray with you today. But I want to pray right now that your heart would be open to what the Holy Spirit would say to you in the next three or four minutes. And that you would stay right here and that you would actually listen to what the Spirit's saying. Come on, prayer teams are waiting.